Okay, and so hello, I want to officially welcome those of you on the call, as well as those of you listening to the recording. I think there are going to be a lot of you listening to the recording. I am Gretchen Wagner of the Anti-Boring Approach to Powerful Studying, and actually I should say in this context of the College Prep Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so delighted to be here with Megan Dorsey of College Prep Results and my fellow podcast co-host, so welcome <laughs> Megan. Thank you. It's really fun to have an opportunity, weird actually, like to see you here because normally we're just auditory. Um, <laughs> well, and so. we just got a bark from Charlie, who, uh, my dog, who likes to jump in on our podcast as Good. well. Good. Well, I'm so glad Charlie is going to be with us today. <laughs> Ho hopefully not much. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to do a couple of little admin pieces, and then we're just going to dive in, uh, starting to talk about the college admissions process. And the admin piece is, well, actually, you know what, I think I'm going to save that until there's some more people on the call, because I'll just name that, uh, for those of you here, Megan and I are going to talk just a little bit, and then if you have questions, uh, you can either ask them in the chat, which are, or the, in the Q&A section, or you can actually come on, I can upgrade you to panelist and you can ask us live and just have a conversation back and forth with Megan. So, but I will show how to do that later when we have some more people on the call. So, all right. Well, the first thing that I wanted us to cover, Megan, because uh, I know we have people listening who have students at vastly different age groups and it's summertime and you know we're moving into the school year and I wanted to know if you could just talk us through the college admissions process like for different age groups what people should be thinking about right now. Sure the first thing I would start with is if you have a student who's not yet in high school that means you know sixth grade seventh grade eighth grade start to work on building study skills emphasizing the value and importance of education and that doesn't always mean emphasizing getting the highest grade possible, but the value of learning and under, understanding and having interests and participating in activities. All of those are things that students should walk into high school with. They don't magically go from, you know, kind of hiding in a hole during middle school to blossoming in high school without some mm -hmm. preparation. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing. Going into ninth grade, that's what my daughter's doing this year, I think a couple of things change from that junior high or middle school approach. Uh, the first is your grades matter. And what I mean by that is they're going to follow you every year in high school as they appear on the transcript that's sent to colleges for admissions. So try to do the very best you can. That doesn't always mean all A's for every student. Sometimes that means the best I could do was a B or the best I could do was a C or the very best we could possibly get through the semester with was a passing grade, a D. Emphasize that, though, especially as parents. That, that may mean setting up some routines to allow kids to be more successful academically. And sometimes it's just saying, hey, these grades are going to matter. I think back to a number of years ago, I had some clients who wanted some advice on college admissions for their son. And they said they had moved to the Houston area from Canada right before the beginning of his freshman year, his ninth mm -hmm. grade year, and didn't really realize that those grades would matter when it came to college admissions. And so between the transition and the stress on the family, they just kind of let things slide and they all regretted it later because as a senior, he said, had I known these would matter, I would have done better. The parents said, had we known this, we wouldn't have let him you know, get some of these lower grades. We thought it wouldn't matter. It does. So that's, that's one of the first things I would say in ninth grade is, is we want to emphasize grades. The second thing is starting to really focus on where does this student fit in? So that may be an extracurricular activity run through the school. Maybe they're joining a sports team, an academic team. They're participating in things outside of school maybe a service organization, maybe a religious organization, but get kids connected for a couple of reasons. One, it gives them an opportunity to demonstrate and develop skills that aren't always taught in the classroom, leadership skills, uh, working with others in sometimes challenging situations. You do that if you're on a team. And also, it means that when kids are plugged into a group 
when things get hard at school or when they're having difficulty with parents at home, they feel like there's a place that they belong and a place that they can go. So I think that's very important. And I would start as early as freshman year talking about college. Go visit a couple college campuses on a very informal tour. A lot of times you can just sign up on their website, go for a couple hours. Don't trek across the country to do this with a freshman, but stop by your local school and give kids an idea of what it looks like to be in college. Because I always joke that for a lot of kids, freshmen, it's like unicorns. College is like unicorns. They've heard about them. They've read about it. Everybody talks about it, but they've never really seen it in person. When you can make it real, then they have an idea of, oh, this, this is what you're talking about, as opposed to this just mythical thing. Yeah. Well, and I want to just check in a little bit because I see a few more people are on the call. And uh, Chase, I'm particularly interested if you, because I know, um, well, if you've been on any college search or college campus visits yet, and then anyone else on the call, if you're parents, if you, if you all have done any uh, college searches I keep on saying search, but you know, the visits. And if you can put that into the Q&A and I'll check in in just a second to, to see what you say, because I'm, I'm curious about how that's going for you. And I will say over the years, I've really seen a rise in the number of younger students and their families who are attending these college tours. Mm -hmm. Now they'll go around the room and say, okay, you know, raise your hand if you're a senior or a junior. There are a ton of people, especially in these summer visits, who have ninth and 10th grade students. Yeah. So I know a lot of times people say, oh, well, that's for juniors and seniors. I don't feel like we belong. Absolutely, you belong. The colleges want to see you. And an informed consumer is a better consumer down the road. Uh -huh. Okay. So moving into 10th grade, and all of these things kind of roll one to the other. We don't stop paying attention to grades. We don't ignore our activities. But going into 10th grade is when you might want to start thinking about some preliminary testing. Mm -hmm. A lot of students might have the opportunity to take the PSAT as 10th graders. And I do recommend that. It's an opportunity to see who's a great test taker because that does not always correlate to your grades in school. Mm -hmm. And the reason you do that in 10th grade is because it's purely for practice. Junior year, that PSAT that students take in October is the qualifying test for National Merit Scholarships. So you know by your 10th grade results whether you've got an okay test taker, a great test taker, or the superstar of test taking who probably needs to prepare for the PSAT their junior year. Again. Oh, so the superstars need to prepare. Yes. Okay. Everybody else, the PSAT is a practice opportunity. Okay. Okay. Those scores are not submitted to colleges for the purpose of admission, but it should be taken seriously. Um, here's, here's kind of an ugly situation that we've seen happening is a lot more cases of reported cheating have been picked up by the college board lately and um, heard from a colleague out of state who said that she had a client whose SAT scores were reported as questionable because they showed such a huge jump from the PSAT to the SAT. Now, I had, I had a client this past year who was in the same situation, but it was from one SAT to the next. Don't take these tests lightly. This is not a, hey, I'll just go in and goof off type of scenario. Even if you're not going to do full-on test prep, always go in with the mind of, I'm going to do my very best, I'm going to pay attention. And I know sometimes for ninth or 10th graders who've been sort of told in school, hey, we're taking the PSAT today, they're just randomly bubbling in things to kill time. Oh, that could come back to hurt you later. I would, I would never do that. Interesting. Um, how do you define a superstar? Christy just asked that in the, in the Q&A. Well, the test is about ready to change. So the numbers I'm giving you are not going to be valid anymore. In general, the cutoff for National Merit Scholarship qualifying has been set state by state with the goal of taking the top 3% of test takers. So I'm in Texas, the qualifying score changes every year. The selection index, which has been the addition of reading, math, and writing, tends to have been between a 215 and maybe a 220. Yeah. So I would always say, you know, the student who's at a 190 in 10th grade, 
thinking of those numbers for I, where I live in Texas, they have a chance of, of studying, moving their score up to that range of qualifying. A student who's average, and I'll tell you the average, national average on the test for juniors is a 150. So, so don't think, hey, you know, I got a 160. This is too low. That's yeah. still above average. Yeah. Okay. But superstar test taking, we're looking at, you know, 97th percentile and above in general. Okay. So, and Christy's daughter is going into the 11th grade. So will then the changes be affecting her? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> should I, should I finish talking about what what we should do in 11th and 12th grade. Yeah, and let's then finish that, and then we'll go ranting about the changes to the Because that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, are these changes, yeah. Because it's, it's not insignificant, and it will affect juniors who are taking the PSAT yeah. okay. um, this fall. Great. So, so in 10th grade, start thinking about the testing. It is not uncommon for a number of uh, 10th graders to have the opportunity to take an AP exam in the springtime. Those are given in May every year. Mm-hmm. You don't have to submit your AP scores for admission. A number of students might wish to brag about them if they do particularly well. But that's something for a student who's been taking an AP class. I always encourage them. You need to take it with the idea that you're going to be taking that exam. Prepare for it like you're going to be taking that exam. And that's something a number of 10th graders might start doing, depending on what your school offers and what they encourage. Mm -hmm. Keep looking at colleges. Keep getting more and more serious about talking about what do you think you want to study? That doesn't mean you have to pick a major. It doesn't mean, in fact, most students don't really have a great idea of what they want to study, but maybe we start with elimination. Mm -hmm. my, my daughter likes a lot of subjects. She's good in a lot of subjects. We were talking about this last week. We know she's not going to be a doctor. She likes science, but has no stomach for the sight of blood. So she's, she's not going to be a doctor, and that's okay we can start narrowing the list by elimination. Uh -huh. What don't you like can sometimes be as powerful as what you do like. Junior year, everybody should write down with a big asterisk, this is the year for testing. This is when in October, the PSAT is given. And while it's practice for everybody else, it's big deal, high stakes for those who might qualify for National Merit Scholarships. Mm -hmm. And the reason is there are a number of schools out there that are still offering full tuition scholarships for National Merit finalists. Uh, the National Merit scholarships themselves aren't that significant, maybe a couple thousand dollars, but what certain schools will offer those finalists to entice them to come to their school, because your National Merit count makes you look good, is significant. Um, keep in mind that all of your really hard to get into places. Your Ivy League and Ivy-like schools are really not giving merit money to anyone. So you could get this very prestigious National Merit Scholarship and, and designation, and that doesn't mean that some of the schools on your list are going to always have money for that. Okay, um, but, if, but if you're looking for money, I mean, this is a great way to do it. There, there's some schools that give you four years pretty much for free if you're a National Merit finalist. So it's definitely worth doing. Then sometime during junior year, students are really going to want to take the SAT or ACT. It's a choice. And most students take it a couple times. Colleges are looking at students' best scores using one of a, a couple different methods and understanding that most students take these tests more than once. Mm -hmm. So uh, a low score, unless it ends you up in the college board's testing integrity office for questions of did you cheat, a, a lower score one month versus another is not going to be an issue. They see variations all the time. With the admissions timeline for college applications being sent in earlier now than ever before, I think most students are going to want to finish their test taking junior year, if at all possible. Okay, so try not to be still doing the SAT or ACT senior year. Oh, it's a big relief if you aren't. <laughs> <laughs> the SAT and ACT are not given over the summer. Uh -huh. So right now, as we have a lot of students going into senior year, there are some kids just sitting on the sidelines because they have got to go in and get that last chance at their you know, September ACT, that's the first time it'll be given, or October SAT, and they have to wait. 
and, and they're almost waiting on finalizing their college list or even on sending some of their applications because they want to see how that last chance at the test goes. Mm -hmm. You can wrap up all your testing junior year, then heading into senior year, it's only focused on college selection and applications. Great. And so junior year is really the time to start getting serious about this college list, narrowing things down. And then the summer before senior year is a great time to start working on those applications. Get that college list narrowed down from, you know, the 4,000 colleges in the country to mm -hmm. something like a manageable list. You know, I like five to 10. I think over 10 becomes exhausting. Uh -huh. um, and then start working on all the things you need for that application. Um, putting together your sort of resume, your list of activities, writing those essays, which can and should be reused. So please don't think you've got to write two or three essays, unique essays for each and every school. Right. But that's still a big, it's a big task. Right. I want to take this quick pause to just say hi, because we have a number of other people on the call. And what I would love right now, Megan and I are sort of going through the timeline about each year, what people should be doing as they move um, from middle school through high school. But I would love to hear for the new folks who are in, like, who are you? Are you a parent? Are you a student? And what grade level are you working with? And if you could put that in here, we'll really be trying to tailor our advice towards you. So that's in the Q&A, which is a click down below. Okay, so finish us up here. So now we're moving into senior year. And so we're working on writing our applications. And what else? A lot of those applications are going to be due in the fall. Now, Gretchen, you and I, and maybe a lot of the parents who are listening, teachers who are listening, might remember sending applications off in the winter of your senior year, or even what we'd call early spring. That's late these days. Okay. A lot of people are sending things in in the early fall. So that might mean October, uh, November. Really, I tell people, get all your college applications done before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanksgiving dinner tastes a lot better when you don't have that weighing on you. And when a student puts all of it in the college's hands, they hand it off, then all of a sudden they can start participating more fully in senior year. Ah. And sort of that pressure is off. And, and it's a big weight. So the only things that really occur significantly in the spring would be January 1st of a senior year. A students and their parents should be submitting the FAFSA for financial aid. Mm -hmm. We start hearing back from all of the colleges all the way up through the end of March. And then in April, students make decisions. And that may mean some final college visits, some deciding between these uh, few schools that accepted you, maybe comparing financial aid offers, seeing which one is going to be realistic. And then the final decision is made. Okay. And that brings us up to that brings us up to graduation. Yes. Dun, da, da. Off to go to college. <laughs> graduation. Good, good, good. So um, I hope that that's a pretty clear timeline for those of you who are on the call. If you have any specific questions about it, I am really wanting to save a lot of time for your questions because Megan here is a wealth of information about all aspects related to college admissions. So we're going to, while I'm sort of waiting to see what questions are going to come in, uh, let's move to talking about testing uh, yes. strategies because as uh, some of you know, I know Valerie knows, but I don't know if the parents know, there's been a major change in the SAT that is coming in. Well, you tell us. What's, okay. <laughs> when is it coming? What's happening? And I know you have some opinions about it. So just tell us everything. I do. Um, I'll start off with, for years and years, the SAT was the college admissions test. Um, back when I went to college, um, I graduated from Rice University. In order to get into Rice, you couldn't use ACT scores. You had to have the SAT. Well, things have changed. And in the, in the last number of years, five, ten years, it's pretty much been that any school that asks for standardized test scores will accept either the SAT or the ACT with no preference given to one over the other. Now, as you do your research, you might see that a school that you're interested in is publishing just ACT results. Mm -hmm. That's probably because most of their applicants are submitting the ACT, and that, more than anything, is going to represent a geographical um, favor for one test over the other. Um, for the longest time, the ACT was sort of a Midwestern test where 
East Coast, West Coast, and here in Texas, the SAT was the test of choice, just because that's what everybody was taking. Um, in some te- in some states, the ACT is actually part of their graduation testing requirement. Oh. It's sort of their state statewide test for um, graduation assessment. I didn't know that. Which is why you'll find students from those states predominantly submit ACT scores. They already have them. They had to do it in order to show competency to graduate from their high schools. So keeping in mind that either test is acceptable. Each student these days has a choice which one do I want to take. And for the longest time, I've said, well, they're about the same. It's, it's kind of like Coke and Pepsi. Some people like one, some people like the other. Some people say they're equal and some people hate them both. And that's true of, of these admissions tests. The major difference had been format. Both tests have pretty consistently tested reading with passage-based questions, grammar, with various grammar written test questions and math. And although the math varied a little bit from one test to the the other, most of it was standard algebra and geometry. But what I what I would call basic math, the math students should learn in high school. But none of it was too complex. Uh-huh. Now, <laughs> now calm yourself. Calm yourself. <laughs> CT started outselling the SAT for the first time ever a couple years ago. And I'm joking that it's like that new Coke. Hey, we've got to keep up with the market. We're going to reformulate. The SAT has decided to make some major changes. And so here here are the big things. Um, The test, which had been three graded sections since 2005, reading, math, and writing, is now going to two sections. One section is called evidence-based reading and writing. Not sure how that's different from reading and writing as separate, but they're kind of lumping them together for one score and math. It used to be that I would tell students, you know, one benefit of the SAT in its current form was that no section was longer than 25 minutes. Right. And so some of my students would say, oh, I just prefer that because, you know, on the ACT, that math section is 60 minutes long and I just can't focus on one thing for 60 minutes. I'd rather switch it up here and there and go back and forth because I'm always changing. Here's the new thing. They're going to longer sections, but fewer, very much like the ACT. Mm. Now we're getting some sections that are pretty much an hour long. Here's all of your reading right here in one place as opposed to making it into three shorter timed sections. Well, and didn't you tell me when we were working on the podcast that one reading selection is like two pages long or something like that? They're very dense. They're very long. Um, You know, the SAT had come under criticism because it had always been very vocabulary intensive. I would say they've taken out the sentence completion questions, which are true tests of just vocabulary, but they haven't gotten rid of the vocabulary. It's now buried into those reading passages. So nobody should think, oh, hooray, I'm free from that. No, it's just hidden better. One thing that I think it maybe works for students is that the writing portion of that evidence-based reading and writing score is now going to passage-based editing. And again, that looks very much like the ACT. So instead of getting this single sentence and you have to edit that perfect single sentence with no other context clues, now you get the equivalent of sort of a peer editing exercise where you have an entire essay with different underlined portions that deal with fixing both grammar and usage, fixing errors, and then editing questions dealing with, is this where things logically belong? If I added this sentence, would it help or hurt? And why? I think that's actually probably a better way to do it. I think most students would prefer that. Um, One of the things that I'm really not happy with, though, is the math. Right. Um, That's what you were fuming about with me. I have been. (laughs) For years, for years, I've told kids, I'll do SAT math questions for fun. Uh I guess I'm a math geek. And I've liked the SAT math because it took knowledge of those things I'd call basic algebra and geometry and then rewarded you for clever problem-solving skills. Mm. So you could find a lot of shortcuts. 
the student who was a super high test taker wasn't just good at memorizing a bunch of math. They were able to see creative and shorter solutions because that's the only way you could get all the math done in the time given. So they rewarded that and really went against having to do tons of long math. The SAT has always given students formulas, so it wasn't a matter of memorizing you know, certain formulas or things like that. Whereas on the ACT, you do have to memorize. You've got to know your area and circumference of a circle. And there are a few things you do need to memorize. They're not provided. So now what the SAT has done, I feel, is they've upped the difficulty level. No longer are we just talking about basic algebra and geometry. There's enough, what I would call algebra two, on this re redesigned test that I would start telling people, you probably want to wait until you have a good portion of Algebra 2 under your belt to go take this. That makes it difficult for students who are just starting Algebra 2 junior year mm -hmm. to finish up their test taking as soon as possible. Um, whereas I don't think that the math tested on the ACT involves a considerable amount of Algebra 2 concepts. Second thing is a new part of the SAT math is a no calculator allowed. And I think part of that is just psychological. So much of our math taught in school these days is taught with a calculator. I know my daughter says we hit algebra, everybody's using calculators, wow. everybody's using graphing calculators. And I know that there are a lot of students who just feel naked without the calculator. They, they want to be able to reach for it. And as much as I do a lot of math by hand, because, you know, when I took the SAT back in the 80s when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Calculators weren't allowed, so I'm used to doing math with paper and pencil. I sometimes reach for my calculator just to verify because under the stress of this time test, there, there's so much going on. So that's a downside to it. The other thing is I find that the math on the redesigned SAT is just exhausting. Mm. There's a ton of reading. I printed off a couple pages. I don't know how well everybody can see this. This whole page, you can't read the question. That's two math questions. Uh, okay. You got to read this whole scenario in order to answer these two okay. questions. Okay. For any students who have reading issues, dyslexia, processing, working memory, the fact that these questions are becoming so long and so dense they're just hosed. It's no longer about just math. It's so much reading, so much pull out the information that you need. And so here's, here's my other example. I know we can't see these perfectly. Here's a page of the ACT. So we can see that the questions are a little bit shorter on this one piece of notebook paper. I think we've got eight questions. That's not easy. They, you know, they could have given us more white space. I would have liked that. Compared to, look at the length of some of these new SAT questions. Oh, it's wow. just more reading. Wow. And so I work with students of all ability levels, from your super high scorers down to your struggling test takers. And more reading, especially in the math section, is not what we want. Okay. It's, it's just harder. So I am not a big fan of the current um, plans to redesign the SAT. And in fact, I'm discouraging kids from taking it next year. Oh, really? uh, one, because I'm not yet convinced that students will do better on that test than the ACT. And if we have a choice, let's go with the test we're better at. Yeah. And second, because as of now, the College Board has not released a score conversion chart for the next test. Mm. And the problem is when this new test is given in March, word is it may take until May for students to get their actual scores. And I have a lot of students. They are used to getting their scores back now in three weeks, maybe four, so they can turn around and make the decision about their next test. Mm -hmm. So if I take a test in March, I want my scores back soon so I can decide whether I need to take the May or June test. Right. So for me, this year, juniors have two choices. First, take the current SAT, which is going to be offered October, November, December, and January. Please don't make December and January your first chance. Make those your chance to retake. Because that's the old... The that's old the current format. format. Yeah, okay. old, old okay. format. Then. Or take the ACT, okay. which is going to be offered you know, with no changes other than the formatting to the essay change. 
in, in order to go, uh, you've got all year so that you can take the ACT. Okay. Good. And I, I think what you were referring to now that I think back to you saying it was a two page reading, uh -huh. that's the new SAT essay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I wish I printed that off. I yeah. didn't. Yeah. Um, the new SAT essay asks students to read a passage. The one I was talking to you about was two pages of a speech by Jimmy Carter uh -huh. and then analyze that work, that essay, based on the evidence used, the persuasiveness, um, and the tools that, that were used by that author. I'm sorry. I know that you're giving students much longer, almost double the time to do it. Most students at the end of this long multiple choice exam are not looking to read a two-page essay and then critically respond to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I just want to wait and see what colleges are going to do. You know, do they want the essay? Yes or no. Um, how are colleges going to treat the new SAT scores? Are they going to look at all areas or just a few? So with that many questions up in the air, I'm just saying let's go with the old SAT, which kind of expires in January, or let's go with the ACT. Let's go with something that's known that we have a lot of good practice material on, and let's let this new SAT start working itself out and find out some more information. So Valerie asked a question a little bit earlier, and Valerie, I'd be curious to hear if we've addressed it yet or if you still have some, some, some questions, but th what she asked was, what are you recommending as a testing strategy for the class of 2017? So I'm assuming that referred to the SAT and ACT. Um, yeah, my testing strategy is avoid the new test mm -hmm. at all cost. Okay. Here's the one exception. Okay. Your super high scoring juniors heading into junior year uh -huh. need to prep on the new test format in order to take the PSAT okay. because the PSAT October 2015 is the redesigned new format. Okay. Those are the only kids who have to prep on that. And here's the other problem. They can prep all they want for that October PSAT. That information doesn't stay in their brain to make it worth it to take the new redesigned format when it comes out in the spring. You know, I used to say for all of my high scoring juniors who are prepping for the PSAT, man, take the PSAT and SAT and, you know, a month apart, knock them both out in the fall mm -hmm. because you're really essentially studying for one thing. Right. This year it's not true. They have to study for something completely new and different. Mm -hmm. Not even last year's PSAT is going to be a good guide for them in studying for this year's test. Mm -hmm. We're going in blind. We've got sample questions, but we have no idea how many they can miss in order to you know, hit that high score. I don't know that anybody's going to know that before October. And I'm thinking, I'm, um, Chase, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting right now I, whether you're going into your sophomore or your junior no, I think you're going into your sophomore year. Um, so he will be taking the PSAT for the first time if that's the case. And he, that, but so it'll be, so he'll have two different PSATs he has to take, one this year and then one the following year? Well, he'll take the PSAT this year if his school is offering it. Okay. And it would be a good indicator for a 10th grader this year to see whether they need to really prepare you know, how, how good a test taker am I? And some people already know. They're like, oh, I'm not a good test taker. In which case I say, you know, there's still value in the PSAT because just the practice of sitting and focusing and paying attention kind of eases our nerves with the idea of, hey, I've done this before and the world didn't come to an end. Right. But it's practice. And those PSAT scores do not get sent to colleges for the purpose of admission. Right. Okay, good. Well, I think what I want to do now is uh, transfer to Christy um, emailed some questions earlier and so tackle her questions. And then after we do that, if there's anyone else who has any questions about anything related to APs or studying or college applications or essays or recommendations or whatever, <laughs> go ahead and put those in the Q&A so that I can start um, saving time for them. And uh, also, anyone can actually just ask a question live to Megan. I can do something that's called upgrading you to a panelist. <laughs> so you'll, you'll come up here. And if you would rather just ask the question live, just indicate in the Q&A that that's what you'd like to do. And then I will know uh, to do that. So in the and Christy, actually, I'm going to read your question, but if you would like to come in and just talk to Megan about it, that's fine too. Just let me know in the Q and A. 
So here's what she said by email. She said, my daughter is going into the 11th grade. She's a high achiever and started school a year early. So she's going to be turning 17 just before she graduates from high school. And um, she wants to know, this is the first of two questions, do you think this can work against her in the application process that she's younger? And how can we make it work in her favor? I think colleges see a lot of applications from students in the age range that we're talking about. And so I don't think graduating at 17, even if she's 16 when she's applying, is that far outside the norm. Okay. I think what colleges are looking for is they are looking for evidence of maturity. And so if there's any question, you want to make sure that that's covered well, perhaps in a letter of recommendation. And someone can talk positively about her ability to carry herself and conduct herself with maturity. Um, yeah, colleges don't want to let in students who aren't going to be successful. And sometimes a lack of maturity is one of those factors. But it's not the age itself. There's usually got to be some other red flag raised in the process. And if you're concerned about it, Christy, just ask that it's covered somewhere else in her application. Letters of recommendation are a great way to have that addressed. And the maturity piece. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, great. And then the second question is that um, you said, also, she had a lousy Latin teacher this year for AP Latin and felt totally unprepared for the test, so she opted not to take it at the last minute. Instead, she focused her energy on her AP European history test, which she got a five on. Yay! Yay! Um, do you think not taking the AP Latin test will be looked at negatively, given that she got an A in the class? Well, Christy, what you need to know is that colleges know what you send them. And AP scores are not a required part of your college admissions sort of package. Um, schools may require SAT or ACT scores, and they may ask about AP scores, but a lot of times that's a decision on the student's part as to whether they want to include that. Obviously, we want to brag about that five. That five is great. But there are a number of students who are not taking every AP exam. Um, maybe it's a requirement of their school that limits them into the number of APs they're able to take. Sometimes kid just wakes up sick. So it's not always a red flag to see that a student took an AP class but isn't submitting an AP test score. So I think a majority of colleges aren't even going to care. Mm. But if we want to get into those real nitpicky places where it's highly, highly selective, very few people are being admitted and everybody seems to be a superstar, of course you want to showcase all of your strengths, in which case – she may want to consider taking that AP Latin exam this school year. Mm. And maybe a little bit more work um, with an outside tutor, maybe a little bit um, studying on her own and preparation would make her feel comfortable in taking the AP exam this May where she didn't take it last May. Great. Cool. Well, Christy, I'll be curious to hear from you in the Q&A uh, section whether that fully answered your question or if you have any other questions and so I saw someone else I think maybe it was Crystal I'm not sure just popped on to the call so if anybody else has any questions right now there's not anything in the Q&A so I'm just going to keep on going with my <laughs> with my own questions to Megan Excellent. but please do this is an awesome opportunity I mean Megan and I are used to gabbing without being <laughs> able to converse with you all on the on our on our podcast so this is such a great opportunity to be able to ask uh, questions live. So please do. And I always tell people sometimes I get so used to talking about something that I forget what people don't know. Yeah. Um, so please ask questions. There's, there is no question too small because sometimes I forget to explain the details of certain things. Right. And I should have. Right. Awesome. Well, and HP administrator. <laughs> <laughs> pop in um, to say, uh, since the student has to write more than one essay, what's the best approach to write the essays without becoming overwhelmed? Great question. Thank you. Uh, first, set out all the questions that you need to address. Um, maybe a student is fortunate enough to be able to use a common application, whether it's the common app. In Texas, we have the Apply Texas application, and you may have then school-specific applications. Find out every single question that's going to be asked and try to find the overlap. So many questions are essentially just trying to ask students, tell us a little bit about yourself. And they use different 
a specific wording to try to get to it. Tell us about a struggle or time you've overcome a challenge. Sometimes what we can do is we can get all those questions together and narrow it down to the point where students are only writing only uh, two, two essays. Uh -huh. To me, that would be great. Um, maybe even one. And they're able to reuse that for every single application. So the first thing is lay them all out and try to overlap and minimize your work as much as possible. If you have to make a spreadsheet for it, do. The other thing is we might say most of them fit under these two topics, except for these few outliers. Sometimes the outlier is something where I could use the base essay from this and just change my intro and conclusion a little bit to hit some of the key words in that question to make it really clear that I'm addressing their question. Mm. Do it. Then you'll get some of the weird questions, the questions that cannot be reused elsewhere, like give us page 512 of your autobiography. Sorry, you got to write that one individually. That one can't be substituted in for something else. Or they might ask you to respond to maybe a particular piece of literature or an essay. Those are very school specific. So narrow it down, try and make the least amount of work, and then brainstorm out what you want to tell schools. So not only should it be the least amount of labor, we want it to cover as much ground as possible. So I always tell the story. I had a girl who wanted to apply early decision to Rice a couple years ago, and her first essay was about uh, doing Chinese dance and going to Chinese school. Mm. And a great essay. She comes to one of her supplemental questions. And I can't remember whether it's a full essay or a short answer, because a lot of these hard to get into schools, um, like Rice, will have supplemental application material due as well. She wanted to write the thing on, on the same exact topic, Chinese dance. I said, I, I like what you've outlined here, but you've already covered that subject elsewhere. So I think it's really important as students are sitting down to write the essays that we don't just instinctively respond to the question but we strategically think, what else unique about me do they need to know that maybe isn't covered elsewhere? And don't cover the same real estate two or three times unless you're really giving something new and different. So it sounds like there are a couple different tasks here. This is sort of my academic coach's brain <laughs> kicking into gear. Like one task is just to sit down together as a family and just make a brainstorm without looking at any questions, just make a brainstorm of what is everything we want the schools to know about me. And it might be my interests. It might be my experiences. It might be some you know, personality characteristics that I have that are unique. And we just sort of make a long list so that as we're working on the college applications, we can go through and check them off and make sure that each one has been covered once, but not multiple times. So that's one task. Is that true? I think that's true. And I think you have to remember that your application is not just your essays. It's your transcript. Right. Okay. It is the activities you have listed. So all the activities you're involved in at school. It may include letters of recommendation. In some more unique instances, a personal interview. It may include, as I was referencing before, those supplemental questions. So there are many places where people might learn something about you. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, you know, I'll just tell you, I did debate in high school. I love debate. Debate was on my list of activities, but it was such a significant part of who I was that that probably was included in one of my essays. Mm -hmm. But strategically, we might look and say, what is significant about me that maybe hasn't come up elsewhere? Mm -hmm. here's, here's one of my examples I tell all the time. A number of years ago, I worked with a girl who had an, an autistic older brother. And I think at the time he was like 24. And she, in one of her essays, talked about how her goal in junior high was to come home every day and try to get him to talk. Mm. And that how every night she would read him a bedtime story. And you can picture this big guy, you know, 24-year-old man, essentially, running to the bookcase like a kid would because he wants his sister to read him a story. That's something that if she didn't tell that story, colleges would not have known that. That doesn't come across on her transcript, and I am pretty sure that her high school counselor and teachers had no idea that this was part of the situation at her home. And you know that having a brother who requires this much care and, and who's going to require this much care for the rest of his life, which is going to become her responsibility at some point, 
has impacted the childhood that she had. It impacted the opportunities that she was afforded because of that situation at home. And she was able not to complain and whine about it, but to really say how important it was and, and how she really learned some things from it. That's a positive way to take something that was significant in her life and through the telling of the story, give positive things about her. Right. Great. I want to get to Jeff's question because it's a really, it's a really great question around uh, people who aren't so high level. And but before we move off the subject of essays, I am thinking about some clients of mine, and especially the younger, like sophomore or freshman sophomores, who haven't really developed a lot of interests of their own yet. Like I'm especially thinking like the, the people who, for like their main interest is like computer gaming, for example. And uh, if they have a hard time in like my intake sessions as they're coming in to talk about coaching, articulating other passions and interests, what, what advice would you give them at this stage of their high school career in terms of like, is that okay? Or is their college application going to suffer a little bit uh, because of that? Just what would you say? This is where when I said heading into high school, it's really important to promote activities and participation not only because it's good for the student for a sense of belonging and achievement, but because that's where they can learn other traits, talents, strengths, interests, I would encourage them to get out there and do something. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a nine-year-old son who is probably, as I speak, upstairs playing Minecraft on the computer. (laughs) He loves loves it. (laughs) Summer has been filled with gaming. Yes. Here's what I know. Kids got to get out and do something else. Um, Mm -hmm. colleges see a huge problem in retaining men through the freshman year to the sophomore year. And a lot of times it's because these guys are getting into college. They're hanging out in their dorm rooms, gaming all day and night Interesting. and they're failing out of school. So I hate to say that gaming is probably not a a great activity, but that's kind of like saying my hobby is watching television. Mm. Yeah. You really got to stretch to make that seem like an academic pursuit. Uh That doesn't mean I don't watch television and doesn't mean my kid doesn't game, but it does mean we've got to have some other things that we're pursuing. And if you're serious about gaming as, um, you know, a career or academic path, then you've got to get out there and establish it. So you've got to get out there and you've got to be working on writing your own programs. You've got to be uh, making, taking an internship Get out there and do it. I know of someone who wrote his own ebook and and sold his ebook and made some money off of that, giving people instructions for how to play a game. So that would be an example of that's the level you should take it to if you if you're wanting to be noticed. Yes. Okay. Yes. Not okay. just I hang out on mom's couch and play games. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so I'm going to get to Jeff's question, and we have another one from Christy. Um, Jeff asked, uh, so what about students who are not in the high-level AP classes and who are not likely to do really good in either of the, the SAT or the ACT? Uh, what would you suggest to those students who are average or below average, and they're not aiming for the top-tier schools, but they're also not necessarily <laughs> aiming for the two-year technical schools either? That's What's a majority that? of kids. <laughs> That's a majority of kids. Not everybody's going to be in the top 10%. Yeah. Not everybody's going to be in the top quarter. Yeah. Um, I think so much of what we hear in the media about college admissions sounds scary. Oh my gosh, so many people are being rejected. You know what? That's if you're applying to a select number of schools. Mm-hmm. You know, if there are about 100 schools in the nation that are super hard to get into, and that's where all the media buzz is coming from. Mm-hmm. Everybody else, most kids are getting in to most of the places that they apply. Most colleges are accepting a majority of their applicants. Mm. The average or even below average kid is going to go to college. And it's not a two-year option. There are plenty of solid four-year options for all of those students. Yeah. And, and honestly, some of these are the, my favorite students to work with because they're very genuine, they're very hardworking, and they're real honest. Hey, I'm not the world's best test taker. Yeah. This is where it's so important to get kids plugged into something where they are successful because mm-hmm. sometimes the messages that they're getting at school can be things like, hey, you're ranked in the bottom half of your class or you're in the bottom quarter of your class. Hey, your scores are below average. And they're getting all these negative feelings. We need them plugged in places where they're going to feel successful. Yeah. And I think I, I worked with two boys a couple summers ago. It just happened to be my summer of the fourth quarter student. Um, all guys. <laughs> and I and I really think about two of them. 
one, have a learning uh, difference that hadn't been diagnosed until his junior year. So his ninth and 10th grade grades were not great. He was ranked in the bottom quarter of his competitive high school, but bottom quarter's bottom quarter, kind of no matter where you go. Um, kid was an Eagle Scout, great kid. He was actually a really good test taker. And he just needed a little boost in confidence to say, hey, you've got some options out there. And he had a lot more options because of his higher test scores. He did have above average um, SAT scores. That did work in his favor. But, you know, he came in with this idea that, hey, I'm in the fourth quarter. I'm defeated. Do I only get to apply to community college? Absolutely not. Um, there, there are a number of, of schools. So in Texas, uh, where I am, there are a number of the state universities that set out um, automatic admission requirements that include a combination of your class rank and your SAT or ACT scores. And there are some automatic admission numbers for students who are in the fourth quarter. Yes, you do have to score better on your SAT or ACT, but those are possible. Everybody who doesn't meet that automatic cutoff for admission then goes to review. And this is where it was essential for this young man, even though it wasn't required at some of these schools, to write essays that really argued his case. Hey, here are my strengths. And get things like letters of recommendation because they're only going to review what a student sends them. And even though some of these schools only required the basic transcript and SAT scores, short list of activities, he needed those other things, the essays, the recommendations, speaking on his behalf when it came to sitting in the admissions office. Mm -hmm. The other student I worked with was not, not so lucky with his uh, test scores. He also had a learning difference. This is kind of a theme we see in a number of students. He was in the fourth quarter. He had below average uh, test scores. The big challenge here is stop looking at those really hard to get into schools. You know, in, in my state, stop looking at your flagship university. He was not going to get into the University of Texas at Austin. He was not going to get in to Texas A&M University. Those are the big name schools in our state. He had to start looking at some other schools. Some of those may be private schools. And you know what? For a student with learning differences, he does not need to be sitting in a class of 150 kids taking multiple choice exams. He yeah. needs, and he was a hands-on guy. He was the president of his FFA group, you know, re really interested in the way things work. He needed a place where he could walk up and ask questions, just like he did in high school, where he could do some hands-on work, not just academic written work. And the challenge for him was find the right schools to which to apply. And those are the schools where once you send them your whole thing, your essays and letters of recommendation and all, you get consideration beyond your numbers. Uh -huh. So find the right schools and understand that it's not as bad out there as the news media makes it sound. Well, I really appreciate you saying <laughs> that. I know I'm, I pass that along to parents all the time because many of my clients are students who are making Fs and Ds and I help them move their grades up to Cs or they're making Cs and I help them move their grades up to Bs or As. But, but always there's a theme of freak out about, oh, no, they're never going to get into a school. And I've never had a client who didn't get into and And both of those boys had Fs. Both of those young men that I was talking that I was talking about yeah. had Fs. Both of them went to four-year universities yeah. without a stop at the junior college. And here's where I would say in some states, they really have a strong community college or junior college system that really feeds students into the university system. Gretchen, you're in California. California, mm -hmm. I think, is, is pretty recognized for that. But some states, your community college or your junior college has a really low percentage of success when it comes to getting those students on to a four-year university. So I, I always tell people, you've got to do some real research as you're looking into your community college to see if that's the type of environment that's going to support and uplift and encourage your student right. to achieve. Or are we just hanging out with a bunch of people who are kind of doing time because mom made them go take a class or two? Right. You know, we want to be in the right environment, and it might be worth searching for that smaller private school that may be out of state maybe costs us a little bit more, but we can make the, we can make the payment mm -hmm. to get into that encouraging and supportive environment. Yeah. It's going to lead to graduation in four years as opposed to this eight-year plodding along, not yet achieving the diploma. Right, right. 
Right. Um, I want, we have one more question from Christy I'm going to get to and, um, and I'll put last call for questions too. There may be time for one more after that. So if there's anyone else who's curious, Q&A is where you should put them. And I just want to add that Valerie just mentioned regarding the gaming question that if it's too late to add another activity for this student, which in this case, with this particular student, I don't think it's too late. But um, she said, I thought this was great advice. She would ask the kid if there's an academic interest he might be able to write an essay about, like a project that he found fascinating and inspiring. So that's a really great suggestion, I think, for anyone. Especially if we can take some of those same problem-solving skills, the same ideas that go into that interest for gaming right. and, and bring it forth in that way. Right. Right, good. Oh, and Jeff said thanks so much for posing the question. It was a great full answer, very informative and wonderful format. Bravo! Well, and keep in mind, a majority of people are not above average students. Yeah. <laughs> they really aren't. Yeah, see, it's so nice here to like to actually be interacting with the people who are listening rather than on the <laughs> podcast where we're just blabbing to each other. Okay, so here's Christy's question. My daughter feels pressure from her fellow students to take only honors or AP classes. I am encouraging her to mix it up between regular classes and subjects that she is not that strong in with the honors and AP classes in her strongest subjects. What can I tell her so that she doesn't feel she needs to take all these classes that will give her the grade bump? Gosh, I'm so sorry because I've, I've sat in that position myself. Um, I remember a student years and years ago when I was a teacher, I was coaching debate. One of my great students was just dying in pre-cal, absolutely going under for the third time. And I told her, why are you not transferring to regular pre-cal? Why are you in the honors pre-cal? She said, I just can't do it. All the stupid people are in there. And so these kids have built up in their minds that there is this huge stigma. I told her, you know, uh, getting a passing grade in regular pre-cal with the, you know, stupid people might be better than failing pre-cal right now. She got in there and finally came back a few weeks later. I said, see, you've got a B in pre-cal already. You went from an F to a B. It's not that bad in there, she says. You know, there are a lot of people like me. <laughs> <laughs> But but it is important because peer influence is huge at this age. Tell her to take what she can balance. And sometimes you need to do this um, ahead of schedule so that we don't end up you know, hurting all the grades across the board because we've overwhelmed ourselves and, and are completely overloaded. But sometimes it's a matter of let her take that one extra if she really says she can do it and see if she can um, hopefully you know quite well your school's policy on when to drop and how to drop and how difficult it will be to drop if you need to. Um, but sometimes kids can do more than we think they can. And they really can, if they're interested, balance all of that. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say is sometimes you just have to look and say, what realistically is happening um, at her school? So I have a friend whose daughter went from public school to private school this past year, and she was so concerned because the private school only allowed the students to take two AP classes per year, and she had come out of a school where you could load yourself up with all AP. I had to remind my friend, you've got to look at what the peer group is doing. Mm -hmm. Here in your new school, the peer group is taking two. Whereas in your old school, and just in order to keep up with kind of your peer group, you really were taking five or six advanced courses at a time. It also means, and she got back to me and said, I'm so glad that I didn't try to insist on doing more. She said, because they really are harder. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we'd like to think that an AP class is an AP class is an AP class no matter where you take it, but that's not true. Uh, some of the places are kind of watering it down. And yeah, they may have kids taking five APs at a time, but that may not be as challenging as the five APs at the school down the street. Mm -hmm. So figure out what's going on in your school, what she's able to handle. And, and part of it is just this honest talk about, honey, what do you want to do with your time? Because yeah, you could sign up for all of these, but here's what you're going to have to give up in order to study it. Maybe you have to give up one of your activities that you really like, or, you know, we have to see this in order for us to allow you to continue. Mm -hmm. And if not, this is, this is the order in which things will be cut back. And just agree on that from the beginning so that you can head into the school year with some realistic ideas. Well, and one of the things that I see so much as an academic life coach is that uh, the habits, the self-care habits or lack thereof that students develop in high school 
are often the habits that they have for better or for worse in college. And with our overachieving students, there can be a real tendency to overwork, to have self-talk where we beat ourselves up. And even like when you said the stupid kids, even learning how to relate to our peers with that kind of judgment can actually create some issues uh, socially as well as just balance wise. And I see so many clients, like I either see the underachieving students who need support to, 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 you know, reach their potential. But then I also see the overachieving students who so desperately uh, need to learn how to handle their perfectionism and, and handle their fear of catching up, like they're always catching up. So I don't know if that's your daughter, Christy, but um, I would just really ask the entire family to look at how you talk about balance and talk about self-care and how parents are also dealing with self-care too, so that Christy said, yes, perfectionist, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which I also want to name just, and then we need to wrap up, but that for so many students that I see, uh, the underachieving students are perfectionists and the overachieving students are perfectionists and it just manifests differently. But all of it is this huge expectation students put on themselves to, to try and be perfect. And anyway, that we could do a whole thing about that. <laughs> I will jump in with one more thing, yeah. which is as a parent, you do need to keep a close enough eye on your kid that if you see week after week, quality of life at your house is deteriorating, self-confidence is deteriorating, and we get any kid who really starts getting those scary signs of they're completely not taking care of themselves or maybe we're actually starting to look into depression, that's a point where you can go into the school and you can yank that kid out of any AP class you need to because you need to preserve, you know, you need to preserve those kids. And sometimes they really don't have the ability to do that for themselves. So I think it's important to just keep tabs on things as they happen. And as much as I like to let my kids be part of the decision making process, there are times where we're going to draw the line and we're going to say, no, this, yeah. this is not going to happen. It, yeah. It's, I don't care if all your friends get to have Snapchat. You don't. I don't care if all your friends get to take six AB classes. You don't. There are certain times where we have to tell our kids no for their own good. And I hope you don't end up in that situation, Christy, but uh, sometimes that does happen with some of your yeah. high achieving, perfectionist uh, driven kids. Well, and I think this is a, a good ending here to wrap things up. Uh, if you if you have more questions, though, folks, I, I strongly encourage you to actually email us at the podcast, collegeprepodcast at gmail.com, because we do some Q&A shows, and we, we love questions. <laughs> and also, Megan, if people want to go deeper with you specifically, what should they know about what you offer? Right now, between now and October, it is test prep, test prep, test prep, uh, SAT, uh, PSAT, and ACT. And unfortunately, my private tutoring schedule is full until October. So it, your only way to work with me between now and then would be to take the classes I teach in Sugarland, Texas. After October, if we're thinking ahead, um, definitely can work with people um, in person in the Houston area or via Skype or FaceTime. Mm -hmm wonderful technology like this um, to do a lot of test prep, but I do some individual consulting with people on working on those college essays or uh, putting together their college list, answering their college admissions questions. Um, good place to find me is collegeprepresults.com. And that way you can sign up for my newsletter, find out what's going on and hear some of my articles as we talk about this new SAT that's coming out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Megan. So fun. To it's been a lot of fun. And thank you, everyone who asked questions. Yes, really. Thank you for that. And now go up and check on the boy in Minecraft and the dog. <laughs> <laughs> boy and, the boy and the dog are taken care of by dad. Oh, good. Good. All right. Well, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>